name is holy, holy Lord. I love you, Lord. I magnify and praise your holy name. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I magnify and praise your holy name. Lord, your name is worthy. Lord, your name is worthy. Worthy, Lord, your name is worthy, Lord, your name is worthy, worthy, Lord, I love you, Lord, I may magnify and praise your holy name. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I magnify and praise your holy name. Lord, your name is sovereign, Lord, your name is sovereign, holy Lord, your name is sovereign, oh Lord, your name is sovereign, holy Lord. I love you, Lord. I magnify and praise your holy name. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I magnify and praise your holy name. Amen, amen. Again, praise the Lord. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundation of the world. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I don't know about you, but this is a great day to magnify the name of the Lord. He brought you through trials and tests and tribulations. He brought you through the beginning of the week, even to this very day. And I guarantee when you trust in God and praise him, your situations has to change. The devil is a lie. He can't stop God from moving in your life and in your situations. As you trust in his ability and trust in his word, God will keep you steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Amen. We're going to open up in a word of prayer tonight, and we're going to get into our lesson where we left off two weeks ago, talking about idol worship, bowing down to idol worship, identifying idol worship, acknowledging and denouncing idol worship. And we're going to get into tonight another part of the book, chapter 4. It might take a wilderness. It might take a wilderness. And this is dealing with when God had commissioned Pharaoh to let his people go from slavery. Many people are still bound today with idol worship in their hearts. Their mentalities are warped because the enemy has taken control of their thought life. They're living in depression and anxiety and stress. They're, they're living a life of worrying and fear, doubt, and unbelief. All because they have not denounced the spirits that come behind those idols that you serve. We need things you put before God that we came to understand you with two weeks ago. It becomes your God. And if you allow those things in your life to manipulate and control your thought life, it controls your destiny. 
We have to take back our power and take back our authority from the enemy and denounce the evil spirits that come from idol worship, which stems from the spirit of Jezebel. We've been dealing with Jezebel for the last several months, and we realize that confronting Jezebel means acknowledging the names of Jezebel as well as the spirits that are attached to Jezebel and allow those things to be purged out of your heart, out of your mentality, out of your mentality, out of your life by the spirit of the living God. If you learn how to repent and surrender and yield and release yourself to the will and the plan of God for your life. Amen. So, Father, tonight I thank you for this opportunity to share your word. I pray, O oh God, that you speak to us by divine revelation. Cleanse our hearts. Cleanse our minds, God. Forgive us for our sins, known and unknown sins. Purify us, God. Make us holy and righteous in your presence. Even, Father, give us to a place in our hearts where we acknowledge the strongholds and the bad habits of God that are attached to idol worship in our hearts, O oh God, and we allow you to purge them out, O oh God, that we might be healed and delivered and set free by the Spirit of the living God. I ask, O oh God, tonight that you make my tongue, the pen of ready right, and my heart engrave your word to speak from the oracle of God's word, a rainbow word that will help change our lives for the better. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. We're living in perilous times where people are far away from the faith. Many have abandoned their faith. They stopped trusting in God, stopped walking in truth and righteousness. Some have reverted back to the things God delivered them from and got themselves into a place of a pitfall of despair. Satan has put a death structure in many people's mindsets because they're not allowing themselves to surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. When you surrender to Jesus Christ, the strongholds, they have to be broken. Your mindset has to be changed. Your heart has to be healed and delivered. Your life has to be restructured and ordained by God to walk in the divine order of God. You cannot walk in the divine order of God if there is no submission. I'm going to say it again. If you don't surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, there will never be deliverance in your heart and in your mindset because of the spirit of the enemy that's behind those unclean spirits that have attached itself to your life. Idol worship is a dangerous place to be in your mind when you yield it and surrender and, and worshiping these things that's not of God. It will keep you in a place of exile. It will put you in a place of bondage just like the children of Israel. All because of rebellion. Because they refused to obey God, they ended up in captivity to Pharaoh in Egypt. And God is instructing us to pay attention, to hear his voice. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. And the Spirit is drawing you out of your dark places. The Spirit of God is convicting your heart right now to recognize the unclean spirits that have entered to your ear gates, your eye gates, into your heart. Even from the things you confess out of your mouth. The Spirit of God is compelling us to come back to the place of repentance. When you come to repentance, you find yourself walking in divine order of God. Exodus 34, 6 and 7, we talked about last week. So the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the Father from the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. This was a promise that God has spoken against the children of Israel because of their sin. When you're in a place where you continue to oblately walk in iniquity, you're allowing the judgment of God to come upon your life, not just your life, but your descendants. Because everything that happens in your family stems from a spirit that's entered into the bloodline. And when you recognize what that spirit is that's in your bloodline, you have to denounce that spirit, rebuke that spirit in the name of Jesus and cast it out in the name of Jesus. We talked about previously how seven sons of Sceva 
sorcerers, how they call themselves going to try to mimic Paul anointing and Jesus Christ to cast out a spirit out of a person. And because they were not authorized, so we've been talking about the last few weeks about the enemy takes illegal access. When he gets illegal access into your life, that's when he would take control over your thought life and keep you in a place of exile and bondage. And these men tried to cast out a spirit in the name of Jesus whom Paul worshiped. And the spirit did not recognize who they were. The spirit cried out, said, Paul, I know, Jesus, I know, but who are you? If you're trying to operate in the spirit of anointing, you have not been prayed up, you have not been consecrated, look out because you're putting yourself in a dangerous territory. Because every time you try to cast a spirit out of somebody else and you're unclean yourself, you're inviting those spirits to come into your house. Jesus told a parable of a person who swept out the house, they garnished the house, they cleaned it up and didn't put anything in its place. Said the spirit that was in that house left that house wandering about looking for another place to do well. And when he found none, said that spirit came back with seven other spirits and the state of the individual was worse than it was in the beginning. So we have to be careful and pay attention what we call ourselves doing in the name of the Lord. Because if you're not walking in divine order, not walking in right and integrity, and your character not lying the word of God, you're putting yourself in a dangerous territory where you're giving the enemy the power and the authority to illegally access your life. And you wonder why things go wrong in your life for so many years and never change. The same old cycle, the same old bondage, the same old prison in your mindset because you never surrender. And the first of all, repentance. If there's no repentance, there can be no surrenders. Amen. This is a walk of faith. It's walk of faith real to God. That's right. This walk of faith is what we have to have every day of our life. Not when it's convenient, not when it feels good, not when the moment's right. It's the word says the just shall live by faith. We live by faith. So with the life we're living, it's the life that Christ has given us through himself who dwells in you, who is your hope of glory. So if Christ is in you, then the life that we live is connected to who? The great I am. Because Jesus was still the Father. He still was the Holy Ghost, even though he was incarnated in the flesh. He still was connected to the Trinity, the triune God. And when Christ died on the cross and rose again from the dead, he was restored back to his priesthood, his kingdomship, and the Trinity in heaven and places in Christ. And, and I mean, in, Christ, in God, heaven and in God. So he was restored back to the seat of authority in the heavenly places. That's what I was trying to say. So we have to really pay attention and study your word, spend time in prayer, spend time seeking God's face. This week, we're going through a week of consecration, a, a time of fasting and prayer. And we invite you to join us. If you haven't started already this week, start from this moment. From the, tomorrow you wake up in the morning. We usually go from 6 to noon. If the Lord leads you longer than that, let the Lord minister to your heart. However long he chooses, and you allow him to do so. Because there's really no timetable when it comes to fasting and prayer. It's the mindset and the heart that's being surrendered to receive from God a rhema word that God wants to pour into your spirit. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, don't be like the hypocrites who stand on the street corners and in the synagogues to be heard of their much speaking. He said they have the reward. But he said, but when you pray, 
enter into your secret closet. And the Father who sees in secret will reward thee openly. That's how God is. That's how good he is. He attest, he'll testify himself through his blessings and favor upon your life that others will see what God is doing to you. And they will be marveled in their eyes and say, this is of the Lord's doing. Because that's what God does. He proves himself over and over and over to us. The scripture said, this is marvelous in our eyes. It says, it's of the Lord's doing. This is of the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. Then it says, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. But before those two scriptures, it says, the stone which the builder rejected became the chief's cornerstone. It said, this, this is, it was marvelous in our eyes. This is of the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. So when you recognize when God is doing something in, in, before your eyes, you shouldn't, shouldn't mind testifying. Amen. We're going to go on into our lesson tonight. It said it might take a wilderness. We left off talking about submitting to evil powers behind idols. We talked about that the last time. So tonight we're going to pick up talking about it might take a wilderness. You know, I, when I saw this heading, before I even read this lesson, I read this lesson before, twice. And when I thought about it, it might take a wilderness. Sometimes God will allow trouble to come into your life to make it seem like you're in a wilderness of spirits. I heard David Jeremiah, a pastor, say today out of California he was talking about the life of Joseph he was talking about how God had to allow Joseph to be thrown in the pit and be sold into slavery he had to let this happen in order for his promise to be fulfilled prior to Joseph being thrown in the pit his father gave him a coat of many colors and the brothers became jealous. Sometimes God will allow the people close to you to persecute you. All because of jealousy and envy in their heart. Joseph was thrown in a pit. They wanted to kill him. But Reuben, the oldest brother, said, no, don't kill him. Let's sell him into slavery. So a caravan was coming by and they sold him to the caravan and he ended up in Egypt. And you know the life of Joseph, he ended up in prison because Pharaoh's wife spoke evil of him, said he tried to come on to her, which was a lie from the devil. But God had it all in the plan because he knew if Joseph didn't go into the, to the pit, to the jail, he would never got to the palace. He was in a wilderness experience, wilderness experience. His life was in chaos and a lot of confusion, a lot of stuff going on. Well, one thing about Joseph, he held true to his love for God, his integrity and loyalty to God. Even when the baker deceived him in the prison, it, I mean, so much happened in his life. But Joseph continued to trust God. We have to get to a place in ourselves where it doesn't matter what people say, what they do. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to keep standing on God's word. Amen. Go to Exodus chapter 13, verse 16. Exodus chapter 13, verse 16. I'm going to put this on the screen in just a second. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So if you don't have a Bible, you can follow along with the reading. And it says, verse 16, And it shall be for a token upon thine hand and for thy frontless between thine eyes. For by strength of hands the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt. So what it's talking about, how God instructed Moses to tell the truth of Israel, to put the word on their forehead. 
That was in between the eyelid, the front lips is between your eyes. And that was the word of God to remind them what God has done for them to bring them out of Egypt. So we got to get to the place in ourselves when we recognize the spirit of God, when God is speaking to us by his spirit. And we know when God delivers from certain things in our lives, doesn't matter what people think, how they feel about it, about what God is doing in your life. So it says it should be for a reminder. So by the strength of the hand, the Lord has brought forth, brought it forth out of Egypt. Verse 17. And it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God led them through the way of the land of the Philistines, led them not, led them not through the way of the Philistines. Let me correct myself. Although that was near, God says, my Bible just, okay, here we go. One second. And God said, lest peradventure the people repent. You hear that? When they see what? War. And they return to Egypt. The reason God did this even though Israel was a mighty strong people, a large crowd of people, thousands of people that Moses was leading out of Egypt, yet they had fear because they really didn't trust God but what he should have been trusting God. God could have took them by the way to the Philistines, which would have been a short journey to the promise, an 11-day journey. But God said, if, unless they see, see fear, you know, see war, and repent, they will repent. In other words, they'll change their mind and want to go back to Egypt. But God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. And the children of Israel went up, harnessed out of the land of Egypt. 40 day journey, which should have only took 11 days took them a very long time to get to the promised land. And the most unusual thing about this is that because they feared God and didn't trust God, they allowed themselves to end up dying in the wilderness. And the younger generation that were raised up under them were the ones who God allowed Joshua to lead to the promised land. If you don't get yourself together and walk in the purpose, the plan, the promise God has for your life, you're going to miss your mark. Just like the children of Israel who died in the wilderness, you'll die in your wilderness. And your children will be the ones who inherit your promise. All because you refuse to surrender and follow the Lord's leadership. <coughs> Excuse me. As we have discussed, the Philistines were strongly rooted in Baal and Dagon worship. That was idol worship. They were strong in idol worship. It says, we will discuss Dagon in more details when we expose the spirit of Delilah in chapter 7 and chapter 8. When the Israelites left Egypt, God knew they were not yet ready to confront the Philistines. You hear that? They weren't ready for war. They weren't ready for battle. As idolatry was still too deeply ingrained in them. Ain't that something? Because as they were in slavery in Egypt, they began to follow the Egyptian customs and worship the Egyptian gods. That's why he said idolatry in their hearts. Because they were not trusting God like they should have to be delivered from Egypt because they were still in their hearts to idol worship. That's what God is talking about. If they had been confronted immediately, listen to this. Okay. 
the defiling nature of the Philistines, then they would have lost the battle between the force between would have been forced to return to Egypt. <clears throat> so if God had not intervened in their life situation circumstance, their defiled nature, their idolatrous hearts would have lost the battle and would have been forced back into slavery. God did not lead them on the road that runs through the Philistines' territory. God said if the people were faced with battle, they might change their minds and return to Egypt, right? How many times God led you out of certain things in your life, out of relationships that was not godly relationship, that was damaging to your spirit, degrading to your character, breaking you down mentally. And God has allowed a situation to occur in your relationship to break it up, to get you out. Hanging around wrong people who got bad habits to influence you with their negative habits. God has to cause a separation come between them to put you on the right pathway while they continue to do wickedness. God's ways is not like our ways, it's thought not like our thoughts. He does things sometimes in our lives that just don't seem to make sense. And God knows what he's doing better than what you and I can figure out. We try to figure out what God's doing in our lives, but all we have to do is learn how to shut our mouths and listen and be obedient. That's the hardest thing I found out in the body of Christ is learning how to shut up and listen. Because a lot of people feel they know so much, you can't teach them anything, can't tell them anything. They know better, better than what you know about themselves. What the Holy Spirit has revealed to you about them, they don't want to hear all that. One thing about the Holy Spirit, when God begins to send a prophet into your life to speak a word to you, it's something to confirm that you already know. Even when you are in, out of order with God and in rebellion, God was in a prophetic word sometimes to yourself. And if you're not listening, he'll send somebody else to bring that word. And then you also put a resistance, say, that ain't for me. I don't know who you're talking about. I don't receive that. That ain't God. But in your conscience, you knew it was from God. Well, you didn't want them to know that from God. <laughs> ain't that something? We do it all the time. But when God has a word to speak into our lives to change our hearts for the better, the best thing you and I can do is shut up and listen and obey and begin to walk in the way God has ordained for you to walk, talk the way God wants you to talk, do what God wants you to do, be obedient to the Spirit of God, to stand fast in the liberty where Christ has made you free. The Israelite had not yet learned to fully trust God. You got people been in church for a very long time. Some even 20 years or more. Just like the children of Israel have not yet learned to fully trust in God. Ain't that something? God knew it would take them 40 years to trust him enough that they will be fully prepared for battle. They had to go through 40 years of testing, 40 years of learning, 40 years of rebellion, 40 years of being stubborn and prideful, what God called them stiff neck. But he had to prepare them to face opposing enemies in order to get into the promised land. So he led them into the wilderness. God even was so stern in, in, in his understanding, in his word towards them. He even told them that I'll fight for you. There's some battles you're going to have to fight. There's some battles I'm going to fight. But that wasn't good enough. Because their minds are still prone to go back to Egypt. Every time they found themselves in a dilemma, they blamed Moses for bringing them out of Egypt. How many times have you blamed your pastor for speaking a word that God told him to speak over your life and things went wrong? 
He spoke what God says to speak. You just were stubborn enough that you didn't want to receive the word. So it's not his fault things didn't line up with the word he spoke to you. It's your fault because you did not repent when he told you to speak it with the word he spoke to you to draw your attention back to God. But you had a callous and a rebellious heart. So you found yourself in a dilemma. And you blame the shepherd for it. We blame God for many things happening in our lives, for death in our families, death in our relationships. We, we blame God for broken marriages. We blame God for, for adultery. We blame God for liars and thieves. They come into your home and different things that happen. We blame God. We blame God for every situation that rises in our lives. When God says, that's the enemy behind the things that happen to you. But we don't see the enemy. We see God. So we blame God. That's what the enemy does. He blinds you from seeing truth. If he knows he keeps you in a callous heart, your heart is hardened. It's impenetrable. What God cannot get in to bring conviction, even bring correction in your life. Paul told Timothy to preach the word in season, out of season, for reproof, for correction, and for and, and, and instruction in sound doctrine. That the man of God may be thoroughly furnished to preach the truth, right? We get to the place we don't want to receive the truth sometimes. Because the truth hurts when you're out of order. But if someone comes to you and they recognize an unclean spirit in your life, and they speak the word of God and rebuke that spirit in your heart. And you receive the word from God, you get delivered. You cannot be delivered if there's no willingness to be delivered. Similarly, we often wonder why God leads us into the wilderness. Have you been in that place in your mind where you wonder why God did you allow this Certain things that happen in my life, it seems like I'm in a wilderness, a dark place, a desert. I feel like I'm abandoned, like I'm all alone. I'm by myself. It's like no one cares about me. No one calls me on the phone. No one seems to be concerned about my well-being. Why do I feel like I'm in a drought? You ever been there? I found out sometimes when you're in that place, that's the best place to be. And the reason why, because it's drama free. You don't have to receive no gossip. You don't have to deal with backbiters and haters. You have to deal with those folk lying and talking about other folk to you and gossipers and all that stuff. You ain't got to deal with all that. Because sometimes God will place you in a wilderness of isolation just so he can get your attention. The Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. To be tested. Jesus knew who he was and what he came to do. But he had to be defined in the wilderness. Sometimes God would take you in a desert place to define the calling on your life. And perfect the anointing upon your life. But we get stubborn. We start complaining. We start murmuring and grumbling. We stop trusting God. Start talking about folk. We get into agreement with negativity. We lie our ear against and hear all kind of garbage and we receive it instead of rejecting it. All because you have not surrendered. All stems from the spirit of Jezebel. Ain't that something? Many times we finally get free from strongholds only to find ourselves in another wilderness experience. Isn't that something? You get delivered from one thing, something else happens. You hear people say all the time, but it's one thing after another. Just keep on happening in my life. You keep confessing it, you're going to keep having it. When situation arises out of your control, out of your power to change, the best approach to that situation is to call on the name of the Lord, rebuke the spirit behind it, and ask God, is something to learn from this experience? Is it something you're teaching me? 
Help me to do what you want me to do, God, even in this place I'm at. I guarantee when you do that, you find a peace come over you. So even if something else did happen behind that, it's like, for example, your car break down, right? Battery go out. You fix the battery, get a flat tire. Now you need a new tire. Then after you fix that, the car starts smoking. And you fix that, something else going with the car. Instead of complaining, Lord, I thank you that you're going to lead me to the right person to fix this car the right way. Lord, I thank you. You're going to give me the resources that I don't have to get this car fixed. Because when you start walking the life of faith, you begin to decree and declare unexpected blessings to manifest to meet your need. Not just yours, but the needs of your people around you. God said in his word to Abraham, he was going to be the father of many nations. And from him, all the kingdoms of the world will be blessed. Isn't that amazing? One man, God promised the entire world going to benefit from it. That's amazing. I get excited with stuff like that. And I thank God for that revelation because when we start paying attention, just because bad things happen to good people, thank God for the bad stuff anyway. That it didn't take your life. You didn't lose your mind. You didn't lose your faith. You kept trusting God's word. You kept believing and decreeing God's word over your life and your situation till it got better. Because faith begins to be proactive instead of reactive. I say it all the time. We have to learn as children of God to be proactive instead of reactive. So just because they cuss you out, I don't have to respond the same way. Just because they're backstabbing you, I don't have to respond to that. People backstab me all the time, and I hear about it. I don't care. Because they ain't coming in my face to tell me. That lets you know they're cowards. Anytime people are naysayers and gossipers about you, about somebody else, and about their Christ, they are cowards. They're not bold enough to come and approach you to your, your face and tell you what they're thinking about you. When you trust God and his word, you keep walking upright in integrity, God will deal with your haters. He had called them to push you even further to your promise, even to your destiny. That's how powerful God is. He take the bad stuff and call the work out for the good. That's what Joseph told his brothers. You read the story of Joseph in Genesis. He told his brother, what you meant for evil, God called the work out for the good. We got to sometimes speak to our situations and tell the devil, you thought you won again. But guess what? Jesus Christ won again. He won the victory. So what you thought was going to take me out promoted me. What you thought was going to stop me and cause me to complain and mumble and grumble caused me to put a praise on it. Because now I know that God is in control that I can praise God in the storms of life, the tribulations, the issues that I might be dealing with in my body. I might be hurting in my body, might be going through illnesses constantly, but it doesn't take away my faith. Because that's when you're anchored in Christ Jesus. doesn't matter what happens, I will not bend, I will not break. And if I do bend, I'm still not bending toward the worst. I'm building to something greater. My God, glory to God, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. We finally get free from strongholds and only find ourselves in another wilderness experience. Could it be that it was the best route for us after leaving our previous Egypt? God will sometimes lead you into trouble for you to learn how to trust him. Have you ever prayed for patience? And all of a sudden, stuff God start going wrong. Folks start coming in your life, just messing with you and picking at you. You pray for patience. God will allow the enemy to provoke you to see if you really can receive patience. God will allow the enemy to test you to see if your mind is going to be steadfast in faith 
and your heart can be connected to God continually. He knows exactly what to do to push your button. Maybe God knew this was the best route. Was the best one in case a Philistine stronghold idolatry attempt to defile us. Isn't that something? God knows what's going to happen before you even realize what's going to happen in your life. And sometimes he'll take you right through the fire to deliver you. He says when you go through the fire, Isaiah 45, 45th chapter, you will not be burned. You go through the water from that overflow you. God said he make the rough places smooth and the crooked places straight. So he knows what to do in the midst of adversities. But do you know how to trust him when you're in your wilderness experience? The enemy knows what to do to lead you into idolatry. And you send people in your life with things in your possessions that are valuable to make you cherish some things more than God. And sometimes God will have to take things away from you to get your attention. Because we get to trust in the things of this world and treasures of this world. We put God on the back burner. And sometimes God will allow the Holy Spirit to strip you of everything you trust in, even people, to get you to return to your first love. In the wilderness, Listen to this. God proves our hearts in your wilderness. God is defining you to make you stronger, make you wiser, make you more skillful, give you the ability to keep standing on the word, keep you a place where you start studying even more, to know the word of God for yourself, to pattern your life after the image of the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ, to be clothed in Jesus Christ, take out the filthy garments of the world, God will get you to a place to prove your heart. Do you love me? Didn't Jesus ask Peter three times, Peter, do you love me? Peter said, Lord, I love you. Jesus said, okay, Peter, feed me sheep. Then he asked him again, Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. The feed my lamb. Then a third time, he said, Peter, do you love me? Peter was getting angry, getting upset about it. He said, Lord, you know I love you. He said, the feed my lamb. What he was talking about is the attitude of love. When you say you love me, your attitude brings you to the altitude of being connected to your Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ to love God more than anything else. Ain't that something? God would prove your heart. See, if you really learn to fully trust in Him. We say we trust God until stuff ain't going the way we want it to go. We say we trust God Till my finances are gone. We say we trust God till my car got repossessed. We say we trust God when my house get foreclosured. I've been through all that. And still trusted God. Lost everything I could lose, but still have my mind. My heart was still trusting in God. I said, focus on God, even in the midst of loss. Because I knew the Lord gives, like Job said, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Because Job even got a revelation from losing everything he had. His children, his cattle, his finances, his possessions, his wife, everything. But he trusted in God. The Israelites' itinerary would be longer through the desert, God knew the best course for their future. Even though your struggles, your issues, 
may take longer to come out of. God knows the best for your future. He knows the course you have to go through, the challenges you have to deal with, the troubles that got to come in your life. He knows the outcome of everything that goes into your life. I remember a while back I spoke, and when you're going through a tunnel, you never see a person camp out in a tunnel. You're going through a tunnel, you're going through the tunnel, because it's dark. And you go through a tunnel, there's an outlet in the end of it. So even though I'm in the tunnel, don't mean I got to camp out in a tunnel. My life may seem to be like I'm in a dark tunnel. There seemed to be no end. I entered into trouble. The trouble lingers. The issues linger. Health problems linger. My mind is starting to get confused. My heart is getting broken. All in the tunnel. Does not mean I got to settle for what the enemy offers to me. Did you catch what I just said? I do not have to settle for what the enemy offered me. Just because these things may be true in the natural. When in this world, but not of this world. So even though my body's been attacked, my mind been attacked, my heart been attacked, my life been attacked, everything I have been attacked, I'm above it all in Jesus Christ. Glory to God. I'm, I'm seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I'm reigning with him over all the principalities and powers and rules of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places. Because that's where we need to maintain our thought life, seated in authority in a place of glory. So just because stuff happened, I can speak to it and command it to loose its hold off my life. Glory to God. I don't have to stay in that place. Once I get in that word, and the word gets inside of me, the word gives me hope. Jeremiah said, Lord, he said, this one thing I recall in mind, that the Lord's mercies are new every morning. His compassion never ceases. Great is thy faithfulness. When you realize how powerful the God we serve is in our lives, he's great. He's phenomenal. He's extraordinary. He's all powerful. He knows everything about you. He knows the beginning and ending of your life. He knows when you're going through a storm of life, nothing going to stop you from coming out of it. We stop ourselves by that thing in here called the tongue. Because I start speaking fear, doubt, and unbelief. Speaking negativity out of my mouth against what God is doing in my life. Then I never see the victory. I never see myself coming out of my issues because of what I keep confessing. I remember I heard a pastor say years ago, when you have a headache, the more you focus on that headache, the worse it gets. The more you confess, I got a headache. I can't shake this headache. I don't know where this headache come from. It just keeps bothering me. I can't rest because I got a headache, migraine. Not saying, saying those things are not going to happen. God sometimes will reveal to you it came from a spirit, from someone you was around. Whoever that individual was that was unclean, the spirit attacked you with a headache to try to stop you in your tracks. And when you rebuke that spirit, many times that headache will go away by itself without medication. Sometimes you might have to take medication. God still heals, even through medication. But your faith and your trust, your ability is not lining and relying on the medication. It's relying on the faith you have in God to heal you. Glory to God. As we journey through the wilderness, 
God uses the necessary challenges. Isn't that something? God uses the necessary challenges to prove our hearts and strengthen our hands for war. God will allow challenges to come in your life to mature you. You hear that? Some things happen in your life to promote maturity. If you're immature, God will let certain people come in your life as iron sharpening iron to mature you, to grow you up, to make you a spiritual adult. To stop sucking on the bottom being a baby. You got people who've been in church for 30 and 40 years still sucking on milk. They have not matured to the level they need to be in Christ because they refuse to study God's word. They only hear the word once a week when they come to church. That's it. That's good enough. But when they go home, they don't pick up their Bible. They read no scriptures. They read no books. They're not meditating on anything but watching the television, listening to radios, Listen to R&B, all this other garbage in this world has to offer you that gravitate to those things and only give God one day a week. Your life needs to be devoted to the Lord every day. Not sometimes, but every day. When you devote your time in God's presence, that's when your anatomy begins to change in the spirit to develop your spiritual muscles. And the spiritual muscles bring forth spiritual strength. Spiritual strength comes from the word of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. Wisdom and knowledge and understanding begin to fill your library of your mentality. Then you find yourself maturing in the things of God. Isn't that good? Because when you desire to know God, you shouldn't limit yourself. Don't let nobody else limit you from being who you are in Christ Jesus. People will make you start down your own calling, down your own belief system, start getting to the place where you stop trusting God, get to a place where you don't want to be, be obedient to God. Then when you get back into your sinful habits and strongholds, find the idol worship, find the demonic forces, giving in to the enemy, they want you to stop serving God. Satan will assign people to be attached to your life on purpose. And when they come, they come with the M.O. to kill, steal, and destroy your anointing. We all anointed vessels in Christ Jesus. Every born again believer in Christ Jesus is anointed. So don't let nobody tell you you're not anointed. Every child of God is anointed. You know why? Because when you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life, he is the anointed one who dwells in you. That means you have the anointing. You have to learn how to operate and use the anointing through studying the word of God, through teachers, through evangelists, through different people coming to your life to pour into you the wisdom of the word of God. Once you learn about your anointing, that's when you become a threat to the enemy's kingdom. So you got to be willing to learn, willing to study, willing to want to know who you are in Christ Jesus, want to know what God says about you, who God called you to be, know your calling, walk worthy of your vocation, what would you have been called, that means your calling, walk worthy, walk like you're qualified. That's what it's talking about. Walk like you've been ordained by God. You're qualified as a, a child of God to have a particular, particular gift in the kingdom. And when you learn how to walk in your authority through your calling, then you have the power of the word of God backing you up. The word going to be for you. The word surrounding you as a fortress. The word says the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to and is safe. That's the word. 
The name of the Lord is the word, a strong tower that surrounds you. And it keeps you secure in God's presence. When you get in that word, the word empowers you. The word instructs you to keep standing fast in the liberty where Christ has made you free. It's up to you to want to walk in the word and be strong in the Lord and empower his might. It's up to you. You have to make a decision. You have to make a choice every day to follow Jesus or deny him. And he said, if you deny him before men, he'll deny you before his father in heaven. I don't want the Lord to deny me. I don't mind telling somebody about Jesus Christ, how good he is. Because if you learn how to build and develop your spiritual muscles, you become wholly bold. That means you get boldness in the spirit to speak whether people want to hear or don't want to hear the word of God. And not allow nobody to intimidate you to cause you to become a coward and stop speaking God's word. But allow the spirit of truth to speak through you, to bring conviction. That he that has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the church. That comes from you knowing the word of God and speaking the word of God. Then God brings conviction, not just conviction, but change in the life of the hearers. I love teaching the word of God. I love it because when I teach the word of God to other people, I'm teaching myself. Because I hear it first. And when God begins to speak by his spirit, that's when the enemy is put to silence. Because I'm hearing God's voice and shutting out the voice of the enemy. You got to learn how to shut your ear gate to the enemy's voice and only hear the voice of the Holy Spirit and hear yourself speaking the word of God to yourself and walking in obedience even through the convicting power of the Holy Spirit to convict you to righteousness. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. We're going to close right here tonight. Next week, we're going to pick up confronting those influenced by Jezebel. Confronting those influenced by Jezebel. That's going to be a really good subject next week. We already learned about confronting Jezebel. We're going to learn how to confront the people who follow her. Because when you start really paying attention and doing what God called you to do, you shut the voice of the enemy from influencing you, controlling you, and, and leading you astray. But when you trust God in his word, the word has the power to heal, deliver, and set you free from every stronghold and every lie of the enemy. You have to trust God in his word and stand fast in the liberty where Christ has made you free. So Heavenly Father, tonight I thank you for this word. Pray to have not fall upon deaf ears. But Father God, the word will convict all of our hearts to turn you and walk in obedience to your word and be set free in our hearts, O oh God, to serve you and live for you all the days of our lives. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Each week, as I do, if you're on here tonight, might be a backslider. Once walked through the Lord, then you got, got into a place you slipped off track, got into a dark place. I encourage you tonight, come to a place of repentance. God will restore you as if you never fallen. So he's married to the backslider. Say, so come, let us reason together. You'll see me as scarlet, they should be white as snow. They'll be red like crimson. They should be like wool. God says, I have the blood of Jesus to restore you even as a backslider. You might be a one who never accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. You can receive this life by making a confess with your mouth. So, for with the mouth, confession is made the heart, man believes the righteousness. So you confess that you're a sinner, believe your heart that Jesus Christ died, buried, and rose again for your sin, you can be born again. By praying this simple prayer. So I ask everyone if you will pray with me tonight, this simple prayer. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you, Lord God, to come into my heart. Forgive me for all my sins known and unknown sins, and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Ask, O oh God, that you come into my heart, restore me, revive me, heal me, and deliver me, and make me a new creature in Christ Jesus. 
Your word says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ Jesus, a new creature, old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. And I ask you, Lord, to come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. And I thank you for saving me in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer and you were backslide, you just got restored. You were a sinner, never accepted Jesus Christ before. You just got born again. So I charge you to find a Bible-based teaching church to get into to learn about your identity in Christ Jesus and learn about who you are in Christ. Begin to walk in the Word of God. Learn how to walk and live by the Word of God. So I thank you again for tuning in tonight. Those of you who are here tonight, I pray that you've been blessed by this lesson tonight. I pray that God has touched your heart in a supernatural way to help inspire you to keep you moving forward in your purpose, your calling God has for you. Stay encouraged. Stay excited about Jesus. Don't let nobody get you to a place where you're deterred from your pathway, even in your wilderness. You move forward in your wilderness. Don't camp out and settle in your wilderness where it gets you stuck. But you move by the leadership of the Holy Spirit into the promised land God has for you. I pray you be blessed. The Lord says next week we resume again at 6 o'clock hour. Continue our lesson. And I pray you continue to spread this word with somebody else that might need to hear this and allow God to be a blessing to them through you. Amen. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord turn your face towards you. May the Lord lift his counsel upon you. May the Lord give you peace. Till next week, shalom. Also, by the way, if you want to sow a donation to the ministry, you feel free to do so. The, the, uh, the info is tagged on the comment section of this page as well. So you can always sow a donation through my cash app. Or even go to Give the Five and look up Redeem Faith Fellowship Church and sow a donation there. Whichever way God chooses you to give a donation, feel free to do so. And all right, y'all be blessed and allow God to continue to use you as a beacon light in the midst of a dark land. Have a good night.